I do is if you have ambition to be great, my job is to coach you to get all that greatness out of you. What's good, Fin Nation? What's good? It's your boy Reason. We are back here for another one. First, I want to apologize. Um, I know I told y'all I'd be dropping this video yesterday, but I haven't really been feeling great the past few days. And yesterday was at the peak, so I kind of just laid back and then uh, had a really busy today, not feeling great. But I was like, you know what? I got to get this video out. The news is piling up because we got a couple of news things I want to go over. The news is piling up a little bit. Plus, I want to get going i'm gonna drop my center big board next that'll be coming next week and there's actually not going to be 15 players there's only be 10 players on that center big board because i really only think <clears throat> there's like five maybe six guys worth even drafting you know so we'll give you that big board next week and then the following week after that we'll do uh tackles um so um Hey, man, and I, I want to say today, I will show you all the video. But if you aren't on Twitter and you haven't seen it yet, the homie Nick Hicks, he dropped um, one of the videos I've been telling you all about with the torque looking like it's coming back from Tua Tungvaloa. I'll show you guys that in a little bit here. So stay locked either way. I got you. I wanted to start off because uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, we, we brought in a punter for a visit today to talk about that. We brought in two top 30 visits, and then um, I want to talk about some of the things that Emmanuel Logba and Xavier Howard had to say today, so we're going to talk about all that stuff. Um, but I want to start off talking about Devontae Parker. Um, listen, when all of a sudden did this media hype train arrive for Devontae Parker? I mean, people are out here now because he went to the Patriots. All of a sudden, we got rid of a bona fide number one. All of a sudden, like I see, like, you know, one of these outlets posted a video of, you know, Tua to, to DVP for some sideline throws and talking about how great his hands are. And it's like, where was this love when he was a dolphin? You know what I mean? Like, why all of a sudden is DVP this great thing in the media's eyes, but for... He's the longest tenure Dolphin, and he never got that love as a Dolphin. It makes no sense. Like, the media is legitimately showing their bias and their hatred towards the team. And I know it goes back to Bill Parcells and how he blacked out the media and how he treated the media and all that jazz. Thankfully, Mike McDaniel is going to repair this stuff. Listen. Side note. Don't think I didn't forget about all of you out there comparing Mike McDaniel to Joe Philbin, Adam Gase, Cam Cameron, and all the lazy takes when we hired this guy, when I was out here leading the Mike McDaniel train. Don't think I didn't forget. Because when this thing starts going positive, the way I've been, listen, because one thing I do want to talk about Xavier Howard today, did people notice the shade? Did people notice the shade Xavier Howard threw today? I don't know if y'all have seen Ace Ventura, but he basically put Brian Flores in the Shady Acres Mental Institution because the shade was real from Xavier Howard today. It was real. And we're going to talk about that. But what did I say? When we hired Mike McDaniel, I said he was a 180 from Flores. I said, he's going to change the culture. Even when I gave you guys the bad news of what I was hearing about certain defensive players not being happy with Josh Boyer, what was I still saying? They're going to work it out. All that happens is Mike McDaniel got to sit him down. Mike McDaniel got to sit him down. And if Mike McDaniel convinces them and they believe in Mike McDaniel's vision, they will follow him and they will listen to Josh Boyer. And now you see what Xavier Howard's saying today. Listen. I don't think people realize. I was trying to warn y'all all last season, but people were like, oh, he's the best coach that since Don Shula. Guys weren't happy coming into work. And I kept telling all y'all, imagine the feeling of going into work. You know, you love what you do, but you hate the people you work with and you hate your boss every day. If you want to stay in the same industry, i.e. a football player, usually that's going to lead you to going somewhere else. 
But the change, the shift, Mike McDaniel's a difference. Defensive players are believing in Mike McDaniel and what he wants to do. X was laying it down. Exactly. Topher says, I was picking up what X was putting down. Exactly. And we'll talk about that. But X was letting you all know. Guys, listen, I'm just going to say this. I had a conversation with Nick Hicks today after he dropped that video because I was like, yo, finally, man. Finally, you dropped the video because I've had that video for weeks. And, you know, I was just – because and he sends me this stuff because – I used to, you know, poke at him. I say, you know, we got to get this torque back, the Tuscaloosa, the Tuscaloosa torque. And, you know, Nick would always be like, don't worry, bro. We're going to do it. We're going to handle it. And then I remember the day he sent me that video and another video. And the other video he sent me was like a, it's a, a drill where it's, you start at 35 yards out and you move up every five yards after Tua completes a rope. And it actually starts at the 25 because Bowden drops one. Because if you listen to the audio, Nick asked Bowden, Hey, how are your hands feeling, Lynn? And Lynn says, uh, And Nick says, Mine are kind of hurting a bit, huh? And Lynn says, Yeah, the one I dropped back there went right through my hands and right through my shirt because two got the torque ripping right now. But, anyways, to go back to this DVP thing, let's pivot all the way back for a sec. When all of a sudden did DVP become this great wide receiver that the media loved so much and was the difference maker for the Patriots? People are out here, oh, well, Mac Jones is getting his receivers together. Boys, I'm going to tell you right now from firsthand source, Tua has not only, not only are those guys all going to be showing up and perform, but Tua's already been getting together. He had to get together with over 15 Offensive players yesterday, or in sorry, recent days. My apologies, and I know that for a fact. So, QB's doing things, QB1's doing things. The bond is getting real. I'm telling you, we're it's about to be a different era, it's about to be a different feeling under Mike McDaniel. I love every minute of it, guys. Smash that like button, subscribe if you are new. Um. You know, with the whole DVP thing, it was time. But let's not start being acting out here like this guy's going to change the New England Patriots franchise. Okay? We play the New England Patriots twice a year. What, are we going to see him once, maybe? And then that one time, is he going to play the full game? Because, yeah, we all know he worked Stephon Gilmore in and out. But guess what? He's even Howard's better. And I'm going to say it again. We can all go back. Y'all remember when Xavier Howard was locking down DVP in training camp a couple years back? And this coaching staff got worried about Devontae Parker's confidence because X was locking him down like it was cuffing season for your girl. That's 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 about what's about to happen. Lockdown summer in the city, baby. So let's stop acting. The media out here acting like all of a sudden, all of a sudden, DVP is this big asset. Why wasn't he this asset when he had a 1200 yard season with us? Where was the hype and the talk? Where was the love when he had 1200 yards a couple of seasons ago? No one gave this man any love. But all of a sudden, now because he's playing in Massachusetts, he gets all this love. It's ridiculous. Tubal gets gritty out here saying 40 receptions, 550 yards, two touchdowns. I'll... That's not a difference maker. Knock yourselves out. Knock yourselves out. I probably, you're probably not even that far off. Let's be honest with yourselves. You're going to be getting thrown to from Mac Jones and say, are you serious? King, uh, I've never seen those guys smile so much during the interview. Don't you get the feeling that when these guys are now interviewing, whether it's coaches, whether it's players, Everyone can be themselves. We're starting to see people, players, and, and coaches, they're being themselves. Like, I don't get it, you know? Anyways, <laughs> Brayden says DVP Hamstring is going to be tight in minus 30 degree weather. Oh, yeah. DJ Bryan says, I'm pretty sure Parker was de ranked dead last in separation the last few years. Yeah, and 
Average separation per route. He was in the last years. He's been one of the worst in the NFL. That is definitely correct. Jeff says, but I thought Mac Jones was a gunslinger. Are super soakers still in fashion? Because there ain't no pistol on that arm. Let me tell you that. Shout out to Scott for the three dollar super sticker. Appreciate that, my friend. Like I say, the vid these videos. When I do these big boards. You know, thanks to XOS Digital Sports, these videos actually get demonetized. My wide receiver video got demonetized. The company that does the Collegiate All-22 film, they they come for heads if you use their film. It's ridiculous. And I've actually talked to the owner of the company. I talked to him last year because they're demonetizing the hell out of me on these videos. And, you know, they wouldn't lift it. They were, like, threatening to, like, take them down if I wasn't okay with them just demonetizing and what, what that means basically is demonetizing in the terms of so donation money, YouTube takes their 30 percent or whatever. But that goes, you know, towards the video, towards inside the NFL. But all the money made off of ad revenue for this video is going to go towards XOS Digital Sports if they hit me, which they hit my wide receiver video. So. These are the videos where I say, hey, if you're ever going to chip in, I appreciate it on these videos because these videos, a lot of work goes into the actual portion of um, of the big board, right? You know, so I say this before, you know, I got to watch the film, take my notes, then I got to come back, put my notes together, watch refreshers on all these guys. And I, I usually take like timestamps and I go back and watch and then I have to chop up the film. I have to put the I have to put my notes together into full blown reports after my refreshers, and then I got to edit the film together after. So it's a lot of work, man. Work goes into these videos. So <clears throat> you know what I mean. Some people half their week of content goes into one of these videos. So I appreciate everyone that does donate, um, in general, let alone for these videos because these actually do get hit pretty hard sometimes, but. That's enough of my pitch for this video. Um, I'm excited because I really think linebacker makes a ton of sense at 102. Um, you know, I think it's going to be center linebackers in play. Um, but we'll talk about all that. And I do – there are some linebackers in this class that I hope fall. I really do. Um, Griffin Gaiman, more proof that the U.S. needs to get rid of intellectual property laws. What a joke. Fins up reason. I agree. Thank you, Griffin Gaming. I agree. It should be fair use. You know what I mean? It's all 22. Like, are we serious here? Like, when I talked to the guy, Griffin, I said, I'm kind of promoting you guys. Like, they were hitting me for, like, small school film. And I was like, you, you know, like, not, you'll be surprised. Power 5 film, you don't really get hit. It's like the smaller schools. And, like, you know, even the smaller SEC schools, even though every school in the SEC is huge. You know what I mean? And I said to him, I said, I'm kind of promoting these players, these programs, you know, by in my videos. I'm not sitting here, you know, and it's only how many minutes of my video, you know? And they're like, nah, we ain't playing. So I was actually contacted, like I was talking to uh, a lady at the company. And then all of a sudden she stopped talking to me and the owner of the company started responding directly to me. So it happened last time. But I do it because, yo, I got to keep y'all informed. Even if none of you donated for these videos and I made zilch, I would still do them because I'm trying to keep you all informed from the draft, especially now that we're getting to 102, 125. If we're going to take someone here late, you're going to see names in my honorable mentions potentially at, in, in the 200s when we're drafting on day three. So it's worth informing all y'all. Informing you guys is the foundation of this channel. That's what this channel is created for, and that's why this channel will continue to exist. Whether it's the draft, the film, the regular season, the off season, free agency, whatever, my job is to educate you guys as best as possible. And these big boards help, especially when I give you guys visuals to go along with my evaluation. So <clears throat> it's all about you guys at the end of the day. I am just, I am just to a tongue of Aloha in the new offense or Chris Greer with Mike McDaniel. All I do is facilitate. So that's all I do. I facilitate. Um, Greg says, I read that JC has knee issues. Try to 
that is the issue. There's two issues with Treader right now. I don't know why I'm going out of focus. Let's get back into focus here. Focus. There you go. The issues with Treader right now are, are the two issues. Asking price and the knee concerns. Yes, the knee concerns are legitimate. But those are the two main issues right now with where Treader is and why a lot you haven't seen you have, you haven't heard a lot about him. Not just dolphins, a lot of teams out there, right? And the knee and the asking price right now. So, and I said this, I think I said it half joke. Well, I said it jokingly, but I do wonder if it's true. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, if we were all athletes in a locker room and anyone who's played, whether it's high school, whether it's house league, whether it's rep, whatever, whether it's college, whatever, whether semi-pro, whatever, you know the atmosphere of a locker room. Would you want the NFL PA president in your locker room? I, I keep coming back and asking myself that. And I'm like, no, I wouldn't. Like, you would need to be, like, legit. Like, you would need to be, like, and apparently he has a moral compass out of this world, which is why he left Cleveland, because he knew the Watson, they were the pursuit of Watson turned him off. Barry Bailey, I appreciate you. Thank you, man. Uh, he says, appreciate your time and effort, Reason. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, everything I do, I do it for you. Topher says, would you be opposed to bringing Eric? I hate Eric Flowers. Where are you going to stick him? Connor Williams, I'm taking Connor Williams. Robert Hunt at right guard, I'm taking Robert Hunt. I hated Eric Flowers. I don't know how long you've watched me for, Barry Bailey. But I hated Eric Flowers. When we made that signing, I didn't like it at all. I thought um, because Tooney got franchised, they pivoted and they knee-jerked and they overpaid for Eric Flowers. And I thought he was trash. I thought Austin Jackson actually suffered a lot next to him. Um, you know, there were multiple plays where Eric Flowers took out Austin Jackson's knee and he lost the block, couldn't hold it because his knee was taken out from Eric Flowers' foot. Um, you know, and it was really evident when they put Solomon Kinley next to Austin Jackson in 2020, and you saw the results Jackson gave you next to Solomon Kinley as opposed to what they were next to Flowers. To me, they weren't in the same stratosphere. That's why I thought Solomon Kinley was potentially going to be special in our offense because if you go look at that, Robert Hunt played so well at right tackle because Solomon Kinley was next to him. And then some of Austin Jackson's best game at left tackle came with uh, Saul McKinley at left guard, which was his natural position because he played next to Andrew Thomas at Georgia. So, you know, that's, uh, that's where I'm at um, with, uh, with, um, with Saul McKinley. You know, I don't think he's a scheme fit anymore. I got to see how fast he moves. Cause apparently he's lost a bunch of weight. So I'm going to save, but as like, if you're going off 2019 and 2020, Saul McKinley, he's not a scheme fit. Right. So pulling's one of his weaker points, and that needs to be a strong point of view, right? Um, so but you know, I, I do think uh they're gonna keep him on as a backup. I mean, unless he's out of weight, which it doesn't look like he is, you know, I think you know, I think uh I don't think uh they'll cut him. Because you never know, right? He could develop in the scheme a year under it when he realizes what he's gotta do and where he's gotta be at. So, and, and he's cheap. He's cheap. So, um, all right. Let's get into a few notes. I want some news and notes I want to get into before, um, before we uh, get into the big board here. Okay. So let's start off, uh, just with, um, I got two articles I want to go over and then some visits. So, obviously, um, if you haven't heard yet, the Dolphins, they decided to bring, much to my chagrin, they decided to bring a punter in for a visit today. Um, the Miami Dolphins brought in Thomas Morstead, uh, Morstead sorry, um, for a visit today, uh, a source told him. Now, you know, someone asked me on the spaces today what I think about uh, – more said, here's the problem, you know, whether you want to talk about Ryan Stonehouse or um, obviously Matariza, there's some good legs in this draft. 
You know what I mean? And it's like, why, I don't know, why go and take a guy who he's on the downside of his career, clearly, you know, he's 36. Um, and, you know, when you look at him, like the last couple of years, really, I mean, I think he played for two teams last year, right? He played for the Jets and the Falcons. But, you know, um, I know last year he still had like 47.2 yards per attempt and um, 42 net yards. Um, but you got you got guys out there that – that the crazy thing about last year, though, was his yards per return. Now, I know that's indicative of the special teams in front of him, but the return yards he had against him, you know, for the amount of returns he had was ridiculous. Um, but – you know, I, I know he still got it because I think his longest punt last year was like 64 yards, which is like what? Um, I think that's his third longest in his career or something like that. So cool. Uh, his hang time, you know, it's almost four and a half seconds. Um, it's just there's young guys out there. And let's be honest, the last three years, you know, there's a reason why New Orleans let him walk, and there's a reason why he went to two different teams last year. You know what I mean? So he's not what he was in, like, 2018, 2017. So, you know, there's young guys to invest in, and I get it. A lot of y'all don't want to invest high in a guy like Matt Arise or whatever. I understand. I ain't hating. But, you know, uh, hey, it is what it is. They didn't sign him. He was in for the visit and they didn't sign him. But speaking of visits, uh, to keep you guys updated with what's going on with the draft right now, um, a guy who I actually really like, um, he's a guard center, uh, Cole Strange from Tennessee Chattanooga. He had a top 30 visit with the Vikings and he will soon visit with the Broncos, Buccaneers, Dolphins, and Seahawks. Again, um, you know, He's another one where they kept talking about center competition. And you see it right there. You know, this guy went from a late day three pick to what he did at the senior bowl and combine. He's worked himself all the way up into the second round conversation. So they're looking at that as a potential guy that could fall. So interesting thing to keep a, um, an eye on. And again, that holds true to, they think they want to bring in um, some, some center competition. And they're going to do it. I, I just have a feeling it's Alec Lindstrom. Like, remember, they don't got to bring Alec Lindstrom in for a visit because they know what he is. Just like if they had their first overall pick, they don't got to bring in Zion uh, Zion for a pick because they know what he is. Zion Johnson from Boston College. They know what he is. So there you go. Um, they are scheduled to meet with Cole Strange, uh, the guard slash center out of Tennessee Chattanooga. And another one that... Like I've watched a little bit of Cole Strange and I really like I really like him. I'm a fan. What but I have him as a guard. I don't have him as a center. I guess like that's that senior bowl effect. But I don't have him as a center. I have him as a guard. Um the Dolphins are bringing in um Florida Atlantic University, Zion Gilbert for top 30 visit. Listen, other than his pro day and him making like a bunch of different people's like freak athlete lists, I haven't watched any of Zion Gilbert. So I would be lying to all of you if I sat here and tried to give you a feel on him. You know what I mean? Like I could sit here and, you know, tell you things about Cole Strange, about how his motor is great, his competitiveness is ridiculous. He's got great lateral ability as he moves across the line of scrimmage. I could tell you those kinds of things, you know what I mean, about his punch. I could tell you all about that. Zion Gilbert, I can't tell you anything about. I haven't watched anything on him. I've only actually deep-dived on a couple corners, um, people that you know I had already watched, like Stingley. I kept up with him. You know, Sauce Gardner, I, I was watching uh, Neil put me on to him last year or whatever. So there's been guys in the corner class, more so like Trent McDuffie, those guys near the top that I've watched. I haven't watched Zion Gilbert. So any Florida Atlantic fan would give you a better uh, report on this player than I would, other than his pro days. Pro days, ridiculous. A four, uh, you know, 
a four four forty, a forty inch vert, an eleven foot six inch broad. That's stupid. At six foot one ninety three, that's ridiculous. So, um, but I've never watched them. So, um, but they did bring they're bringing him in for a top thirty visit. So there you go. Uh, a couple interesting, you know, I had heard that they'd be dabbling in the corner market. And now that I'm seeing this, I'm like, huh, interesting, 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 interesting. Um, we're going to go through these two articles and I want to show you guys that video that performed dropped uh, and show you that the torque is coming back with to a tongue of a loa right now. Um, so let's uh, let's look at Ogba first and what he had to say today. And there's a couple of notes in here, too. This is from Barry Jackson. And he says Emmanuel Ogba got the dream combination, by far the richest contract of his life and the chance to stay in the place he didn't want to leave. Ogba's future with the Dolphins has been in doubt until the Dolphins raised their offer moments before the start of free agency, dangling a four-year, $65 million package with 32 of that guaranteed. I'm very happy, Ogba said Wednesday at a news conference at team headquarters. I felt we had a chance to make something work. I love the city of Miami and wanted to be here for my brothers and helped with the coaching staff being retained on the defensive side of the ball on March on March 14th, the first day of free agency, Agba planned to leave his home for a workout, but agent Drew Rosenhaus advised him to stay home. Drew said, chill, I'm going to need you. I stayed in my living room patiently waiting, and Drew called me and gave me the details and said, what do you think? I hung up with Drew, called my mom and my dad and said, what do you think? They said, it's for you to decide. I said, I'm excited. I've always wanted to be here. It meant a lot to me. My family signed back with the Dolphins. Since signing the contract, Agua purchased a house that's nice, real, spacious. Christian Wilkins said, I'm hosting the first D-line dinner. According to a league source, another team was prepared to give Agba similar money if the Dolphins hadn't increased their offer just before the start of free agency. Agba had nine sacks in each of the past two seasons and was the only player in the NFL last year to log at least 20 quarterback hits and 10 passes defended. His 119 total pressures in the past two seasons are six most in the NFL, behind only Aaron Donald, Max Crosby, Shaquille Barrett, TJ Watt, and Miles Garrett. In 2020, he started 12 games, recorded 42 tackles, 9 sacks, 6 tackles for a loss, 21 quarterback kicks, hits, 3 forced fumbles, 1 fumble recovery, and 5 passes defense. Um, last season, he was even better, starting 11 games, recording 41 tackles, 9 sacks, 9 tackles for a loss, 1 forced fumble, 1 fumble recovery, and 12 passes defense. Um, Ogba addressed other issues. We'll get into that because I wanted to say this. I remember in 2019 when we made that big splurge and me and EM went up on a panel with ball game, TD, all those cats. And I remember it was like three or four in the afternoon. And I remember, you know, everyone was hyped by Byron and me and EM were like, yo, Ogba. You know, we were like, this is the perfect blend of size and athleticism for what we want to do defensively. This guy, if he stays healthy in this scheme, it's going to be nasty. And this is why I talk about players who we brought in that have health issues like or durability concerns, like Taron Armstead. Look at the durability concerns for Ogba before the last two seasons. You know, again, I'll go to McDaniel. Look at Trent Williams before he came to the 49ers. He was washed up. They only had to trade like a third and a fifth for him, right? And look at what he's turned into. One of the best players in the league last year other than Aaron Donald. So you look at Ogba, and it's just beautiful to see how perfect Ogba is for what this team wants to do defensively. I think Ogba, you know, he is going to speed up the development of Jalen Phillips. Ogba addressed other issues. Of the ton of money spent by the Dolphins in free agency, he said, I'm glad we took care of our own. The Miami spent so much that it felt like there was no salary cap. He said he's not sure how many defensive changes will result from Brian Flores' dismissal. Josh Boyer, who was retained, will have some new wrinkles to the system, Ogba said. Of most of the defense being retained, except Vince Beagle and Justin Coleman, Ogba said, we did something special. There's still a lot of work to be done. It helps because we all know each other's games. You know what a guy can do next to you. It's what we can do better. He said he wants to improve on taking on double teams and rushing the passer. Rushing, you want to get better rushing the passer? Give me 15 sacks, Ogba. Let's go. On the change from Flores to new coach Mike McDaniel in terms of how the locker room feels, it's different. A lot of guys are happy to be back. Why weren't they happy to be back with Flores? A lot of guys are happy to see each other again. It's fun. The whole locker room wants to build off last season. On McDaniel, Ogba said he's definitely unique, a good player's coach. He's very smart. 
Ogba said new left tackle Taron Armstead will be a force on the offense. That that's a dog. We needed that. And I played with Tyreek Hill in Kansas City. Of closing the gap with Buffalo, Ogba said we have to step up and do our best to help this team win games. We have to get the offense better. They have to get us better. With an opponent like the Bills, it'll be a challenge, but we should be able to get that done. Buffalo's won seven in a row. That stops this year. We go five and one in the division. Let's go. We split with the Bills. Punter visits. The Dolphins are bringing in veteran punter Thomas Morstead for a visit on Wednesday, a source confirmed. South Florida talk show host Andy Slater first reported. The 36-year-old was released by the Saints last March after 12 seasons with New Orleans. He spent time with the Jets and Falcons last season, earning NFL Special Teams Player of the Week honors in Week 12. Morstead, a Pro Bowler in 2012, averaged 47.2 on 40, 47.2 yards on 45 punts in 14 games last season, which ranked ninth in the league. Many of the University of Miami's draft prospects will be at Dolphins headquarters Friday to work out for the Dolphins on their annual local day for prospects who attended high school or college in South Florida. Several, but not all of those prospects were also invited to a dinner with Dolphins brass on Thursday night, including general manager Chris Greer. Among those expected at Friday's workout, Derek King, Cameron, Cameron Harris, John Ford, and Michael Harley. Where's Rambo? Among others. Also expected to attend, I like this, FIU Devontae Price. You guys remember I took him in that first mock that I posted publicly? I like that. Uh, who ran for 2,203 yards and averaged six yards per carry in five years with the Golden Panthers. He's considered among the top 10 running backs in the draft. I'm telling you, that's the perfect third down back. Height, weight, speed, prospect, with low bell cow size. Lance Zerline said Price needs it well blocked and must play faster, but his traits are... Are, his traits are what teams are willing to work with and develop. Also keep an eye on Zion Gilbert, who has five career interceptions. He was among those invited to the Friday workout and Thursday dinner with the Dolphins. One UM player not at the Dolphins local day, Charleston Rambo. There he is, who met NFL team, who met NFL rules to attend either Dolphins local day or the Cowboys local day. He opted for the Cowboys because he spent much of his life in Texas, having grown up in Cedar Hills, which is 17 miles from Dallas. Uh, Zach McLeod, who spent his UM career at linebacker before thriving as a defensive end and senior, will be at Dolphins headquarters Thursday to meet with coaches and take a physical. After Devontae Parker, the Dolphins only picks uh, after... I don't know why I said after the Devontae Parker, but after the Tyreek Hill trade, the Dolphins' only picks in next month's draft are 102, uh, 125, 224, and 247. But Miami has two first rounders, a second rounder, and two thirds in 2023. Here's one way of looking at Xavier Howard's new 90 year, 90 million year deal. Under his contract in place until last Friday, he was due 39 during the last three seasons. He's now due 55 over the next three seasons. Of the 90, 36.3 million is guaranteed as Pro Football Talk first reported. It's a good deal for Howard and agent David Cantor, who convinced the Dolphins to amend a deal with three years left, which is very unusual. I mean, you know what? Sending a message will take care of our own. He's the best man corner in football. I'm not going to complain. I'm not there yet. So, and I know he'll stay healthy. He's been staying healthy the last few years. Let's go. Let's go. And then um, before we get to the two of video and the big board, guys, let's talk. I, I got to Xavier Howard's shade was real today, ladies and gentlemen. So it's not the first time Xavier Howard has entered the Dolphins facility in early spring to begin workouts in anticipation of another season. And it's definitely not the first time the all pro cornerback has done so with a new head coach in place, though. It's only been a few days since the start of the team's off season workout program, which began Monday. Howard feels a shift in the atmosphere with the Dolphins, new coach, Mike McDaniel, and an off season that has been full of change. Everything's been different since I got here. Howard 28 said Wednesday, speaking for the first time since he signed a new five-year deal with the Dolphins. The energy, everybody's happy. Again, another defensive player. Think of how giddy the offensive players are. The def Another defensive player is saying everybody's happy. And I feel like a lot of things can be special here with Mike McDaniel. He's bringing that energy, and hopefully he can get the offense up to par to the standard that we expect from both sides of the ball. Everybody can get the job done here. Like, the energy, everybody's happy. What do you think he's talking about? You know? 
Flo was an energy vampire out here. The Dolphins on Wednesday officially announced Howard's new contract, which goes through the 2026 season. It adds two years to his previous deal and includes $50 million in new money. Last Saturday, the team traded wide receiver Devontae Parker to the New England Patriots, which now makes Howard, who was selected in the second round of the 2016 NFL Draft, the team's longest-tenured player and the one who has seen a mire of coaching changes and Rod's overhaul in Miami. In restructuring Howard's, in restructuring Howard's deal, which his agent David Cantor said was in the works for 15 months. The Dolphins front office kept its promise to revisit the contract after they found a short-term fix to the uh, disgruntlement last summer. The whole process has been a great process, Howard said. Just excited to be a Dolphin and continue to play here, hopefully retire here, and hopefully win a Super Bowl here. Let's go, X! Man, I want you to retire a Dolphin so bad. Howard's new deal was the latest domino in an active offseason for the Dolphins as they worked tirelessly to rebuild the offense. The team's biggest acquisition, the trade for wide receiver Tyree Kill, reunites a pair of former Big 12 stars and 2016 draft mates. I feel like we'll get each other better, Howard said. I played against him in college and also in the league, so I just want to focus on getting each other better. On defense, the Dolphins retained every starter from 2021. Josh Boyer's defensive coordinator keeping intact a unit that spearheaded a eight and one finish to last season. Like previous years, the strength of that defense is expected to be its secondary. With Howard as that focal point, its continuity, Howard believes, will serve the team well as it looks to continue to build off last season's record. It's exciting to have the defense back, Howard said, especially going into our third year in the same defensive scheme, nothing changing. Well, some stuff will probably change, but the main stuff that we talk about on the defensive side doesn't change. And especially the offense. I just told Mike McDaniel, I said, man, I've got to get my hamstrings right. We got a lot of speed over here. I'm excited about everything that's going on around this building. Let's go. The belief is real. With every, with over three months until training camp and even longer until games that actually count, Howard couldn't get caught up in setting concrete expectations even as excitement around the team reaches a boil. Right now, the buy-in and getting younger players acclimated to changes with a new staff are at the forefront of his mind. I like where his mind's at. That's my CB1. That's the best man cover corner in the league. Thinking like that, love it. Howard did, however, quickly reflect on a long journey that included early injury setbacks, Pro Bowl honors, and everything in between. When he found out late last week that an agreement on a new deal was reached, he felt relief. Then it really kicked in. I thought, shit, let's get back to work. Let's go, Howard said. Check your pulse, Xavier and Howard. I just try to keep a tunnel vision on myself and keep my focus straight and continue doing the stuff I've been doing. And hopefully at the end, when I'm done playing, I get that yellow jacket. Man, so do I. I love X. I'm a huge X fan. Everyone knows I love X. I've always been adamant about taking care of him. Everyone knows I got PTSD from Rashad Jones, and I wanted him to retire, and his body, his body fell apart. And I've been rooting for X so bad. And the last two years have been so rewarding as an X fan. And I do hope he retires a Dolphin. And I, I, I really hope he retires the Dolphin. And I hope we get a couple Super Bowl rings for him because we get him one or two and he's getting that gold jacket. I can guarantee you. I can guarantee if we get just one for Xavier Howard, he will get that jacket. And that's a player I want to see in Canton. So miss me with the Stefan Gilmore. He was never as good as X. X and JC Jackson are the best man corners in the league, and X is the premier man corner in the league. Never been able to see a guy bait and hook quarterbacks onto throwing routes they got no business throwing since Dion. All right, let's get into uh, the video, guys. Um, we're gonna get. I want to show this to a. Um, video to you guys and then we're going to get into the big board so i'm telling y'all that torque baby that torque is coming back um i gonna play this a couple times for you my best advice is watch the the uh light post but what you're going to see is lynn bowden he's standing at a cone a green cone that uh, has four on it the reason why it has four is because uh a cone is set up in 10 yard increments so that's the fourth cone down, meaning this is a 40-yard throw. Mm -hmm. What you are about to see is a 40-yard rope from Tua Tungvaloa. 
the torque that I'm telling y'all he needs to get back looks like it's coming back. Let's go, baby. So here is Tua with that Tuscaloosa torque. Oh, Ooh. how beautiful is that sound of the pigskin hitting those gloves? Let's go. And I gave you all the full. If you go on Twitter, you only get a four-second clip. One more time for you all. The Tuscaloosa Torque. Woo! Let's go, baby. One more time. Oh! Here comes that torque, baby. Tuscaloosa torque. Let's go. Let's go, baby. It's coming back. It's coming back. He's, you know, you know, he's gonna get more of his athleticism back because it's another off season and another year removed from that hip. And that torque is coming back. Well, look out. Just saying. Look out. If that torque comes back. Oh boy. Oh boy. There, are, you know, there's probably people out there. That's 39 feet and seven eighths. That's not even 40 full feet. All right. 40 yard frozen rope on a dot. Let's go, baby. That's my QB1. All right, guys. With that all said. We're going to go ahead. We're going to get into um, my linebacker big board here. Um, and let me just hold on a sec. We're going to go ahead. We're going to get into my linebacker big board. Um, smash that like button, guys. Help me with my friend Al. You know who it is, Algorithm. Um, help me out, bro. Boys, girls, help me out. Smash that like button. Subscribe if you are new. We've officially passed um, 7,500. So let's get to 10,000 before the season starts. Let's do it, baby. Let's go. Let's go. So we'll get into this. Um, again, I do think at one 102 or 125, this is realistic. I think this is plenty of realistic. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into this. Um, and as always, we're going to start off with honorable mentions. That's, that's just how we always do. So let me tee this up for y'all. You know, and I am really hoping one of these guys in the top six from mine falls to one Oh two. I, I really, really am. Please like, give me a Leo Chanel. Give me one of these guys to fall. Please, for the love of everything holy. All right, let's get into this, ladies and gentlemen. So, starting here at 15, in my honorable mentions, uh, we got Zacoby McLean, a great one defender, but would have an adjustment period, I think, moving inside to a 3-4 inside linebacker, good athlete. Play solid sideline to sideline speed and a high motor, a little undersized of 5'11, 228. Um, Damon Clark, Damon Clark, Damon Clark, Damon Clark, however you want to pronounce it. I was really high on him, but that spinal surgery and missing his rookie year dropped him big time for me. Uh, he's an absolute tackle machine, always has a nose for where the ball is, um, or where the play is going to go. Good in coverage, offers a solid package as a mic where he played most of his time at LSU. Um, number 13 for me is Brian Asamoa. Um, and my graphic, I spelt the Asamoa wrong on the end. So, but that's okay. It's M O A H not M O H A. Uh, he can defend the run or hold his own in coverage with good speed and athleticism. He's a hard hitter who displays a high football IQ and is, um, pretty dependable in the open field. He needs to play through traffic better, though, and weight-wise is undersized, um, which can definitely cause issues when you're taking on blocks. Um, number 12 for me is actually one of my favorite sleepers. Um, you know, uh, he's very instinctual. 
Um, you know, Darren Beavers, he flashes his instincts consistently in the run game. He never oversells on play actions, misdirections. He's also a solid tackle tackler, though he did miss occasionally from what I remember seeing. Stellar against the run, who excels in pursuit um, of the ball carrier and is also a decent pass rusher, who is also better than average in coverage, who is also a former safety that can play Mike on the strong side or even he came off the edge at Cincinnati. Um, the thing is, he's not an overly impressive athlete and his lateral quickness is okay at best. Um, then, um, obviously for me, 11, and I like Channing Tindall a lot from Georgia. I think he's a solid tackler um, with more pop in his hits than a can of soda at times. He can really thump. Uh, sheds blocks, plays well in traffic, and is stout against the run, fitting the inside linebacker role Miami needs. The thing is, he's average at best in coverage. Um, slow feet, late recognition, and reaction at times. Uh, doesn't show the same instincts he does in coverage that he does against the run. Now, moving up into my top 10. The number 10, I have Mike Rose. Good size at 6'4", 245. Consistently shows the ability to make plays at the linebacker position against the run, either swallowing ball carriers up at the second level or filling a gap and making a stop at the line of scrimmage. He's a smart and sure tackler. Doesn't get caught taking a bad angle or having bad or having pad level issues. Um, has shown the ability to be a playmaker in coverage. He had five interceptions in 2020 and can buzz in the flats. Displays high football IQ, good instincts for the uh, position. And he leaves everything on the field every play. He gives 110% effort. Um, the only thing I would say is his sideline to sideline speed and his range isn't that great. And he's not an impact player rushing the passer. He can get washed out. Um, number nine for me is um, Terrell Bernard from Baylor. Um, shows good instincts while reading and reacting very well in the run game. Very good athlete who is rangy with good sideline and sideline speed. Sure tackler. From what I saw, if he wraps a ball carrier, they're going down. Um, I do think his football IQ instincts range and tackling ability along with his ability to communicate with um, his defense pre-snaps make Bernard an ideal fit as a Mike. Though his 6'1", 224 kind of screams that he might be more of a fit at will. The thing is, he's got all the intangibles to be a Mike, but his body might be saying, I'm a Will, because he does need to shed blocks better and show better play strength, um, especially at the point of attack, right? And that's all because of his size. Um, number eight for me is Quay Walker. Maybe one of the surest tacklers in this class. Walker seems to always take the perfect angle. He can thump downhill, displays a wide tackling radius. Um, he can cover tight ends in the seam or out at the intermediate level or take a running back out of the backfield if you need him to. He's a good run defender. Uh, he shows good lateral movement, play strength, and has a super high motor. Elite pursuit and close down defender. Biggest issue is his instincts lack at times. Some plays it seems as if he's a step behind reading and reacting in time. Number seven, um, one of the best linebackers in this class at rushing the passer is Christian Harris. Um, and creating pressure in general. Absolute headache for linemen. He's also one of the best coverage linebackers in this class, excelling in both zone and man with his speed and athleticism. Tight ends and running backs are normally not an issue. Very sound and sure tackler who you just don't, you know, you just don't see him miss. He gets his arms around you and you're you're wrapped. You're done. Um, High-level communicator who was responsible for audibling uh, Bama's defense. Displayed a high-level football IQ. Obviously ideal for Mike, but he can play the will too. Um, he's only played the linebacker position since he came to Bama. He was a wide receiver and a cornerback in high school, so he still doesn't have a ton of development and ceiling left to reach in his game, which is appealing, I think. Um, you know, number six for me, you know, I got two F FCS guys in my top six, basically. Uh, it's Troy Anderson. Ideal size to play inside at just over 6'3", 243. Nice blend of speed and athleticism to match his size. Super high football IQ. Sees plays develop before they happen. Man, if we can get this guy at 122, please. Right, uh, He sees plays happen before. Um, he sees plays develop before they happen regularly. Communicates well pre-snap. Great in open space, whether you need a tackle or for him to play coverage against a tight end. Um, 
you know, he's got a very explosive first step. Once he locks in on the target, he shoots like a torpedo towards it. Shows good agi- agility and lateral movement. Impact player when he's blitzing, though his rush, rush move package can improve. He relies purely on speed and athleticism, but yet he still shows a knack for it and still gets you results. Um, easily teachable, and due to him, again, only playing the position for a few years, Troy Anderson was actually a quarterback when he first came to Montana State, which might remind you guys of a certain linebacker who played for North Carolina, Chaz Surratt, last year. Um, the thing that I have noticed, and that's what helped him develop a, a high football IQ, he's very comfortable in the box, you know, and he's comfortable as an overhanging defender. He just shows a level of comfort. Great in pursuit, takes good angles. Obviously, there's a question because he's only been playing the, the, the position for – short period of time and the competition in the FCS. Now you got to jump to the NFL needs to work on shedding blocks. Again, that's where his inexperience at the position shows up. Now, number five on my list is Brandon Smith out of Penn state. This guy shows a high level sideline to sideline speed and range in coverage or against the run. Remember profile traits, profile traits, profile traits, Played both Will and the Mike at Penn State, showing he has versatility. And though his instincts tend to leave a bit to be desired at times, they're sufficient enough at this stage of his development. Um, good pass rusher when given the opportunity to display an explosive first step. Um, and he does a good job to dip blocks to free himself as a pass rusher. High effort on every down. Um, he's gotten better every year in college. And that shows that he has a work ethic to get better in the areas that he needs to get better in and improve in. One of those is he's not very well, good at shedding blocks. I actually noticed a lot of the players in this class had issues shedding blocks, not just him. Um, You know, he can make a quick read and fly to the ball like a torpedo. Um, y- You see it all the time. You know, I really do think his strength is pursuit. Uh, is there's the pursuit angles he takes and his pursuit speed. Um, this guy is an elite athleticism. You know, you are banking on coaching up the traits here. That's what this guy comes down to. And he's got all the traits and he's flashed with his instincts, you know, that he, he can get it done. So, and he's been used as a mic and a will. Um, and he's even been used in the slot. So, um, remember this guy has like, we're talking like crazy speed and athleticism for the position. So when you got that at Mike and Will, like, let me put it this way. You know, he's got better instincts than Jerome Baker had coming out of Ohio State. You know, he, he's ready to coach up. Number four for me is an absolute man crush, guys. This, he, I'm sorry. Leo Chanel is an absolute man crush. And when you get to the highlights, Remember, he wore 45 and number five during his time at Wisconsin. So when you see 45 going like a torpedo, that's Chanel. When you see five, that's Chanel too. Um, he's probably my biggest man crush at this position next to Muma um, and Troy Anderson. Um, see, but I don't let man crushes affect where they rank. Chanel, 6'2", 250. Absolutely crushed the combine with a 4'5", 340. 34 bench reps, uh, one and a half second, 10 yard split, a 40 and a half vertical and a 10 foot, five inch broad jump. Chanel is the ideal Mike in our defense shows a nose for always being around the ball consistently flashes elite instincts against the run as he's always in position to make a play and is always visibly running the Wisconsin defense. When you actually watch him pre-snap, he has a long speed to run a ball carry down past the second level or the thump in his truck stick to stop a ball carrier from even getting to the second level out of the backfield. He's one of the hardest hitters in this class. Chanel is a damn near flawless tackler, stays square, drives through his tackles, closes the deal every time he wraps a ball carrier. Probably the cleanest block shedder in this class, which really stood out to me, has no problem engaging and clubbing his way through, lives for the contact side of the game, can stack shed blockers or drive them back. Also one of the best blitzers in this class is just an animal at times that can, can't be caged. His explosive first step with good sh- um, short area burst and quickness allows Chanel to be very effective one-on-one or an open space against ball carriers. And his motor never runs out of fuel. Immense effort is given on every down by Leo Chanel. Now, 
The one weak point I will say is coverage isn't a strong suit, but I do think with his athleticism and with his IQ, I think he can be coached up at the next level and be far more than competent in man or zone or whatever you're going to ask of him. I, I just think this guy just pops off when you, when you watch him, he just leaps off the screen. I, I don't know what else to say. He is, this guy is special, man. And I know people remember, I loved Zach Bond coming out. Uh, I believe out of Wisconsin too, a couple of years ago, Leo Chanel is next level, man. Just thinking of him. It's ridiculous in our defense. Um, You know, number four, Three for me is Chad Muma out of Wyoming. Um, I think Muma is actually the best tackler in this class. Um, and he racks them up, you know, not just tech. He's the best tackler in this class at getting them and technique. I think he racks them up, racks them up as he led the country with 142 total tackles last season. And 85 of those were solo. But it's not just about piling them up. Like I said, he's the surest tackler displaying the most polished technique when it comes to squaring, wrapping, driving through, and finishing. Ideal size at 6'3", 239, with great athleticism, short area bursts, and in a crazy explosive first step. Look at him just stand the running back up there. Obviously, he's very instinctual, as seen by his tackle total alone. But it shows up, too, with his football IQ. He has great vision, doesn't get fooled by misdirections and such. Overall, he's just a high-level processor at the linebacking position. If Chanel is the best block shedder in the class, Muma is probably right there behind him. He can drive through blockers, disengage, and use his lateral quickness to get around or dip under blocks. Has very disciplined eyes. Never getting caught out of position and patience allows him to be one of the better run-defending linebackers in this class. The, those three traits also show up in zone and man coverage, where with blend of IQ and athleticism, he can cover the flats, the seams, or receiver coming across the middle. High motor, never takes a playoff, never stops coming at the offense, and plays like you'd have to cart him off the field to stop him. Uh, more than sufficient enough when it comes to range and sideline to sideline speed for the NFL. Needs to be refined as a pass rusher as he tends to get swallowed up or washed out at the line of scrimmage. Obviously, like Troy Anderson, there is the question of the leap in competition going from the FCS to the NFL, but I love Muma. Number two, Nicobe Dean. He's obviously the favorite of a lot of Dolphin fans. These next two guys are pipe dreams for us, I think. It's evident Nicobe Dean is one of the most talented linebackers in this class. This man defines torpedo. It's ridiculous. Dean's biggest strength may be the pursuit angles he takes and the closing speed he possesses. He just knows where the ball carrier is going to be and where they are intending to take the play like it's second nature. Uh, he's another great tackler, displaying fantastic technique. Dean drives through his hits, keeps his legs churning, keeps a good pad level, stays square, clamps down when wrapping. Dean is also one of the best off-ball blitzing linebackers in this draft. He has an innate ability for getting into the backfield and causing issues for opposing quarterbacks. Dean's motor is freaking relentless. Like, it never ends. Like, he was a nightmare for DJ Ute. Um, He was also, he was just a nightmare for teams. It was stupid. Like, I get the D-line is good for Georgia, but Nagobi was next level. Um, speaking of coverage, um, you know, he's as solid as it gets in his linebacker class, whether in zone and man or man. Um it's because he has really disciplined eyes, strong at reading and reacting, but also shows high level of awareness in coverage. Again, following the quarterback's eyes. That's what he does. Um, probably the most explosive first step and quickest downhill trigger um, to make a play when it presents itself in this class. Shows no issues of block shedding as well or playing through traffic, even if he is a little bit undersized. You're, you're starting to see... The guys who can shed blocks are high on my list here, right? Really, other than size and length, Dean doesn't have very many glaring holes in his game. Um, obviously, because of his size, he may need to increase his play strength at the next level um, to kind of avoid being washed out. We're trying to get at the second level. But, I mean, this guy just has, you know, his helmet finds the ball. It, it just, like... He just knows where it is, and he's so quick. It's stupid. So talented. Big fan of the Kobe team. Number one for me is Devin Lloyd. 
Uh, I, I just think he's a complete package. That's why you're talking about like ideal size, ideal strength, athleticism, high football IQ, and he's a leader on top of everything else. Uh, elite reading recognition skills blended with patience and anticipation and a quick ability to diagnose what's in front of him allows Devin Lloyd to be an impact player in the run defense consistently, arguably one of the, you know, arguably the best run defender in this class. You know, I don't think uh, anyone's going to argue that, um, you know, that he's one of the best in this class for sure. Um, you know, he can blitz the passer. Um, you know, take on a ball carrier one-on-one in open space, cover a tight end up the seam. Um, he can really do it all. He can, you know, he's a solid sure tackler, whether he wraps you low or has to take you down by his shoelaces. Lloyd will take you down by all means necessary. He can lock down and man if asked to hold his own in zone and has some sneaky good ball skills. He can break it up or intercept it as seen by his five career interceptions before those coming in 2021 alone. As versatile as anyone, can rush off the edge, line up as a Mike or as a Will. He's a bona fide leader. He was the captain of Utah's defense and also its main communicator pre-snap and in huddles as the plays ran through him. And he fills gaps when he's asked. Um, has a large tackle radius with arguably the best sideline to sideline movement and range in this class. A decent set of pass rush moves, and he does not get fooled by misdirections. Look at that hit. Whew, reverses and such. Um, he needs to up his play strength a little bit uh, to help him shed because he actually does, can show up and have issues with shedding blocks at times. Um, and not really overly, though, where I'm concerned. The biggest issue I have with Devin Lloyd is his aggressiveness. Sometimes he's over-aggressive. Sometimes he's over-aggressive um, coming downhill, and that can cause him to whiff on a tackle. He needs to clean that up. Uh, but yeah, guys, that is um, my top 10 linebacker big board um, and honorable mentions heading in to this year's draft. There's plenty of options here, obviously. Um, you know, you go in the later rounds, you know, you got a Darian Beavers, a Channing Tyndall, um, you know, Terrell Bernard. Those guys are going to be around when you're at 102, 125. But you got to wonder if one of those guys in the top six slips a little bit. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. I am locked in. I think center and linebacker are going to be in play at 102 and 125 and potentially punter. So a lot of talent in, at the linebacker position in this draft. Um, you know, you got a guy who, a prospect for me, who needs a little work at five with Brandon Smith, but the athleticism and the traits are off the charts. If you coach it up, you got something, you know, I do think, um, you know, if you're talking about one Oh two, who can be on the board again, you know, I think it's a real possibility that a, uh, Terrell Bernard, Mike Rose, Channing Tindall, Darren Beavers, they're going to be there. They're going to probably be there at one twenty five too. Now, when you start getting into, I'm not as obviously in the Kobe and Devin Lloyd will be gone. Muma, Leo Chanel, and Troy Anderson. I would love one of those three guys to be there at 102. Would love. So we'll see how it all works out. Um, I am, uh, you know, there's still picks to be made. And the next board that I will be dropping for all y'all is going to be the center big board. That'll be coming next week. All right. Um, so here you go, guys. Um, I am going to be back, um, either tomorrow or Friday. I'll keep you up there. I might be back for both, but, um, I got, uh, I record a few things tomorrow, but other than that, I'll be back. If I come back tomorrow, it'll be around nine o'clock. We'll see how it goes. If, if there's any news, obviously breaking, I'll be here for you, but I appreciate you guys spending some of your Wednesday with me. I hope you enjoyed the big board. Um, and man, such positive things hearing from Ogba next regarding the coaching staff. So excited, but guys, I appreciate each and every one of you smash that like button. Help me out. Smash the like button, subscribe if you're new. Um, and I will see y'all next time until then. Y'all know what time it is. Everyone stay happy, healthy, safe, and blessed fins up all day, every day, baby. <laughs>